recording. Yeah. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. This event will be held in English, um, if we haven't said that yet. Um, since we're, uh, this event is in view of the special issue um, at the Intelligence and National Security uh, on this topic, um, we might as well do it in English so that everybody and all our efforts are focused on that and directed on that. We will, the presenters will present in English. Uh, they will, the Q&A can be in English or in Hebrew as you, uh, as you prefer as an audience, but the presenters um, will be immersed in their, uh, in their works uh, in English so that we are all uh, tuned toward that. So uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here um, at this uh, special event uh, dedicated to early warning, strategic surprise and intelligence uh, failure. We will also, uh, we will hold the award ceremony uh, in Hebrew. So, uh, so stay tuned. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, and that's about what we what we uh, will have will have today, and more about that uh, later. I will just as I uh, as I always do. I will. Um, so that's it. No more batteries, I guess. Okay. Or, all right. Okay. So these will be our speakers. We will have four uh, four speakers for today. Then we will have the award ceremony that we postponed from uh, 2023, of course, due to the due to the war. But as I always do, I want to briefly uh, present to you our upcoming events. So in April, we will also have uh, an event dedicated to uh, to October 7 and the uh, repercussions. So we will be discussing uh, investigations of. Uh, intelligence failure. We will have a very interesting panel with uh, one, one and a half uh, practitioners and two or three, depends how you look at it, uh, academics that have done some work on the subject. So we will have Professor Shlomo Shapil from here, from bar -Ilan University, who's not with us today because he is doing an intelligence inquiry in Germany, uh, as I understand it. Now he's on the uh, commission that investigates into, that uh, inquires into the uh, failure in the Munich massacre in 1972. So he's on the Bundestag uh, commission, right, uh, doing that. Um, so he's not with us today, but he's also written on the subject. We will have uh, Dr. Udi Iran from uh, Haifa University, who has also done some uh, practical and also academic work on, on the subject. Uh, Moti Gluska, who's a little uh, late, uh, but he will join us uh, in a moment. He just uh, finished his PhD, uh, I believe, in Ben Gurion University, uh, doing comparative studies of Israeli inquiries um, in the subject of uh, intelligence and national security. And uh, last but not least, we will have advocate uh, Fad Nachman Ibar, who, uh, who is a litigator and presented some uh, key figures who were subject to such inquiries. So she will give us this aspect of the, of the matter, the mandate, the scope, uh, et cetera. Uh, I will jump uh, a little bit into the future. The May event of our forum is not yet uh, determined, but in uh, June, we will have the annual conference of the Israeli Association for International Studies. It was uh, it was our first time, and it was I think, uh, to my opinion, it was a uh, it was a success last year. This year, uh, it's even a bigger success because we had uh, about fifteen or sixteen submissions to the to the conference, which means that we will have about three panels uh, on intelligence studies at this uh, particular uh, local conference. And on top of that, we have organized a roundtable uh, to discuss the root causes of the October 7th uh, intelligence failure. So uh, we will have uh, Professor Uribe uh, Joseph, whose uh, who's, uh, outlook on that is from the uh, psychological uh, perspective, the human factor. We will have Isaac Ben Israel, who's an advocate of the philosophical uh, approach to intelligence, the scientific approach. We will have Ayelet Arel Shalev from uh, Ben Gurion University, who's uh, who's a lecturer on um, gender and security, and we'll have Sagi Polka, who's an advocate of the humanist 
uh, perspective, the humanist approach to, to intelligence, learning the enemy, knowing the enemy, culturally, uh, linguistically, etc. So this is uh, also going to be a very interesting uh, panel that we will have uh, then. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is about it. Um, I will now, uh, we will now go back to the, to the uh, reason we're all here uh, today. So uh, I will just uh, like to take the opportunity to remind us that while we are discussing, this is the first event that will be, uh, that we are as a intelligence studies forum are dedicating specifically and directly, we're going to touch this raw nerve uh, and delve into our own intelligence failure. So I would like to take the opportunity to remind us all um, that this failure came with a heavy price, with a heavy human cost. Um, the, the fact that the IDF did not have an early warning um, caused the life of uh, more than 1,200 people on the day of October 7th alone. And also um, over 200 people were taken hostage. Still over 130 are, uh, are in captivity. Uh, undergoing things that uh, that we uh, we don't wish to even imagine. Um, so we, and so I'd like to take the opportunity, I guess, uh, in uh, in all of ours behalf, uh, to say that we want them released now. So now we can uh, move on to our uh, to our panel. Uh, we have four presenters today. Um, we have. Uh, a, Ofer Guterman, Udi Eran, and uh, David Semantov will be uh, discussing the decline of, uh, of early strategic warning. We have Noam Alon discussing pluralism. Uh, we have uh, Shira Shacham, who's uh, still on her way here, um, discussing the intelligence failure of the May 2021 uh, Arab-Israeli riots. And we have uh, Professor Yaakov ben Chaim discussing infogap theory. Um, so, uh, and uh, although they were all selected to present here, I can, uh, I would like to take the opportunity again to remind you all that the deadline for the submissions is at the end of this month. So you can all submit your abstracts if you have any studies on the topic, we would be happy to review them uh, for the special issue that I'll be editing, uh, guest editing together with Dr. Shai from the George from Georgetown University. Um, so we still have until the end of the month, but we have already uh, a few dozen uh, submissions. So uh, please do your do your best so uh, so that we make sure we have uh, we have an Israeli footprint on this uh, on this special issue. So uh, we will start with uh, with our first presenters, and maybe Noam you will present second, okay, and and only then uh, Sheila. <clears throat> So, um, Thank you, Ofek, and uh, good evening to everybody. So I'm presenting on behalf of the team. So uh, Woody was already introduced. Also a member in our institute, in the Institute for the Research of Methodology of Intelligence. And uh, also uh, David Woody Simantov, deputy head of our institute. Um, so the topic of our uh, research is the rise and decline or rise or fall of strategic early warning in Israeli national intelligence. Um, Research, of course, in our regard, done in the light of the uh, October uh, surprise. Um, okay. So uh, the question we ask ourselves is, um, what role does the uh, strategic early warning uh, is playing in Israeli security and intelligence uh, thinking? And uh, what changed, what, what if any, changed in the role of strategic early warning over the years? 
And, and if so, what were the driving forces behind these this, uh, changes? And um, the way we structure our uh, research or research proposal is first, of course, by starting with some uh, conceptual uh, framing of the matter, uh, talking about uh, early warning theories, definitions and ter terminologies. And also we would like to touch uh, the subject of change in intelligence organizations and change in priorities, because um, our hypothesis is that um, the, the, the role, the big role that the strategic early warning played in Israeli intelligence has changed uh, and quite dramatically over the years. Um, and then the, say the empirical side, uh, the core of the research would be uh, trying to uh, to uh, write the ge genealogy of early warning in Israeli intelligence thinking, um, and uh, of course analyzing it also in light of uh, the 7th of October surprise. Um, regarding resource and methods, then we um, we will of course base uh, the literature on open historical and theoretical uh, materials. Also, um, especially IDI. Uh, military intelligence, Israeli military intelligence um, texts, both uh, declassified and classified that we try to disclassify, and uh, interviews as much as we'll uh, find it um, um, necessary. So um, before we delve into our hypothesis regarding the, the, uh, the genealogy, um, a, a quick uh, um, reminder, or at least the way we see a strategic early warning. So uh, a time effective update of decision makers on the rising threat to national interest, interests, which needs to be addressed. For example, war intentions, war plans, or a significant uh, military uh, force buildup of an enemy. Um, and intelligence in the strategic early warning is not supposed to predict the exact timing of the realization of the threat, but rather to arise decision makers to take action to mitigate the, the threat. And basically, I'm rushing in the line of uh, 10 minutes. Um, this is our hypothesis of the four uh, stages, main stages of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, strategically warning in uh, Israeli uh, defense, uh, in Israeli uh, intelligence. So, um, in the 1950s and 60s, we saw the formulation of, of the strategy and of the uh, strategic early warning. Then uh, the next two decades, 70s and 80s, the, the, the rise, gradual rise of uh, early warning. And then since the 90s, what we are saying is that we see a gradual decrease, gradual uh, degradation of the place of uh, strategic early warning in intelligence thinking in Israel um, until of course, uh, and, and what we believe is that this is part of the reason of the failure of uh, early warning in the uh, in, uh, 7th of October. Um, so briefly, I'll touch um, the main points here. So in the 50s and 60s, um, strategic early warning is uh, a pillar in uh, Ben Gurion's uh, famous uh, national security concept, which is still relevant uh, to these days. Um, so basically, um, strategic early warning is kind of a, a bridge between, uh, between um, deterrence and the concept of deterrence and the concept of uh, defeat of the enemy. So once uh, the, end, the uh, intelligence is seeing that deterrence is breaking, it's no longer relevant, it needs to uh, raise the flag and say that uh, um, there is a probable... Uh, an imminent war, or and then uh, the uh, the uh, early warning uh, helps uh, gives the time in order to mobilize the reserves in order to defeat the enemy in a uh, very decisive and quick uh, manner. And in 1956, we saw uh, the manif manifestation of of this in the uh, preemptive Sinai War, in which um, in which uh, we saw that um, intelligence raised the flag regarding the force buildup of the Egyptian army. And so we went into war in order to uh, at least uh, delay the threat. 
And also in the 1960s, we saw the Rotem incident in which two Egyptian divisions uh, entered into the uh, Sinai Peninsula without the intelligence noticing it. And the lesson learned was that we need to increase our efforts uh, on uh, strategic early warning. And then of course, in the 70s, in light of the Yom Kippur failure, again, the, need, the, the lesson learned was the need to even more increase our efforts on strategic early warning. And then we saw the list of mechanisms put in, in, installed in place in order to improve our uh, strategic early warning capabilities. The indicative sign model, uh, eight, uh, unit uh, A200, recalling itself, reframing itself as a collection and early warning unit, the devil's advocate unit under the head of the IDI, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Now, when we move into the 90s, things are, uh, things are, are changing. Because first of all, we have, uh, and, and, and as we can see it in the uh, formal um, presentation of the uh, IDF, uh, named surprise attack decline. And uh, this was in light of a few factors, a few driving forces, such as, of course, the peace agreement with Egypt. Um, so no more war with Egypt. And then we saw the gradual degradation of the Syrian army. So even a less threat over there. Um, and on the other hand, we saw the rise in new enemies, uh, such as Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, so terror organizations. And so the issue of uh, early warning shifted into more tactical issues of uh, their, um, early warning, tactical early warning against uh, cyber attacks, against terror uh, attacks, and so on and so forth. And then lastly, we see uh, in the, uh, you think of it maybe around 2012, uh, 2000, something like that, uh, since the Arab Spring, so this gave the notion, the notion that uh, no more war, the, the, the uh, conventional big, uh, conventional military wars, it's a thing of the past. Um, and uh, also at the same time, we saw the rise in the capabilities of Israeli defense. So Iron Dome uh, and also big fences and so on and so forth. So you have the notion that there is no big threat of, uh, of uh, um, conventional war because of those two driving forces. Um, and also, on the other hand, we saw a rise in the technological capabilities of intelligence um, and the rise in the amounts of uh, good uh, intelligence, good, uh, the big data in intelligence, and also the rise in the need for intelligence to commit itself to operational and tactical missions. Uh, so for example, uh, cyber attacks and the targeting and the campaign between the wars and so on and so forth. Um, so, it, so all of those driving forces shifted the, I would say the North Star of the intelligence, of Israeli intelligence um, from uh, strategic early warning as a, as a North, uh, North Star that, that guides uh, this is the paradigm in which all the intelligence apparatus is working uh, into intelligence supremacy, in which strategic early warning has become just one of many other uh, missions, uh, not uh, even the most uh, important of them. And lastly, um, a slide. Um, so um, this is the shift we're talking about. And, and, and if we're maybe trying to think ahead, then uh, what would be the future of strategic early warning in Israeli intelligence? Then of course it has to do with uh, the way intelligence will uh, try to explain to itself the, the, the different tensions it will uh, find itself in. Because on the one hand, we have, uh, we have seen the disastrous effect of lacking early warning. But on the other hand, we saw yet again, the disastrous effect of relying on early warning. So perhaps there is a place for re-examining the place of early warning in our in Israeli national uh, security uh, concept and strategy. And of course, there will be the tension between the rising needs for and for uh, and requirements uh, for resources to do strategic early warning the best, the best we can. But on the other hand, all the other new missions of the intelligence um, and their requirements uh, won't, uh, 
won't go away. So um, this is uh, how um, some, some of the tensions that the Israeli intelligence will have to uh, ponder for itself. And um, lastly, I would just uh, say that we will, it, it's in the beginning of our research, and so we will be very happy to hear your remarks regarding the periodization, regarding uh, the driving forces, if we meet something, if you think differently, and also if you know from the literature relevant, relevant themes in the literature regarding the turn, uh, sorry, uh, early warning that we can relate to uh, in the context of our research. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're doing it uh, ISA style. So we, you will keep your questions to, to the end. We will uh, now move to Shira's uh, presentation. Please, Shira. Okay. Oh. Okay. So thank you, everyone. So I'm going to explore now the um, uh, part of the strategic surprise in May 2021 uh, turmoil in Israeli mixed cities. Um, before diving in, I just want to say that this uh, part is uh, part of a wider research that I um, did about prevention and mitigation of civil violence, that the Shomer Chomot event was a case study in it. Um, and I'd like to add to the background that um, while researching civil violence, so we can, I can take you a bit um, to the past and talk about the first intifada and talk about the October 2000 events, all our civil violence uh, eruptions uh, that we didn't predict talking about early warning. So just picking up from your ending point. So where's the slide? Nico? Uh, ah, okay. Okay. Okay, so just um So what, um, the way I call it now, it's like the perfect storm within a predicted flash. And I'll briefly refresh our memory uh, regarding May 2021 to see why I call it that way. So I'll briefly uh, do the timeline, the surprise itself, um, a bit of findings and theories that I use, causal model and conclusions. In terms of timeline, I'm sorry, trigger, <laughs> trigger warning. So it is another uh, conflict that we're talking about. Um, we remember May 2021 events, but we started back in February 2021. Uh, if you all remember, we had the Sheikh Jarrah eviction order of Palestinian families from uh, an Arab neighborhood by Israeli uh, Jews um, foundation and families. This clash, by the way, um, attracted the international attention as well as the, the local one. So it was very um, creating unrest. And then in March and April, Palestinian terror attacks in Jerusalem and the West Bank increased. <laughs> and on May 6th, we're talking about days of Ramadan, like today. May 6th, um, around four days before May 10th, uh, which is like the last evening of Ramadan before the Eid. Um, Jewish extremists joined Sheikh Jarrah's protest and member of parliament, Itamar ben -Gvir, and things are uh, escalated over there. What we have in the last three days of Ramadan, we see riots on Temple Mount, clashes with the Israeli police. Um, and we also have the Jerusalem Day Jewish Parade. I guess you remember this. Um, so what we have on May 10th is Jerusalem on the different um, layers of it um, escalating. So we have the Sheikh Jarrah event and we have the Jewish um, Jerusalem Day Parade and we have clashes on um, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, and then at 6 p.m., prior to, the, to that, of course, Hamas threatened Israel that unless it will do something, it will launch uh, rockets. 
Um, and this is what's happening um, at 6 p.m. So the way I framed it is that we had an anticipated clash in Jerusalem and Gaza. No one was surprised. Everyone were well prepared for it. Israeli police, um, ISA, IDF, right? So nothing was uh, surprising here. But then I'll take you to Lod, uh, the mixed city of Lod. Um, so what we see here is that within all those events, we have Arab residents that protested uh, in solidarity with Al-Aqsa, although it was an unpermitted um, protest, um, it was spontaneous and it was next to the um, uh, city's mosque. And so this one has lighting. Anyway, so, so I'll just show it here, but you can see where the arrow is. If you all remember the, um, the Arab resident that switched the flag, the Israeli flag with the Palestinian one. So this really made um sure. okay. Anyway, so this um image was really went viral. Um and Lod was um unresting during that evening. Um we have a Jewish armed resident, of course, um turmoil was started, and then a Jewish armed resident um uh, felt threatened and shot at a few Arab residents. Um and Musa Hassan and one of them died. So what we have in the next day is May 11th, uh, shock and funeral. The funeral was different. The funeral was different um, because it was um, the gist of the clash that was ongoing in Jerusalem and in Lod um, years before. Okay, so it's it's like a Jewish um, resident of Lod, of the Garito and in Lod uh, specifically, and an Arab resident that on this same evening. Um, and what we had, uh, we had the riots that continued and spilled out to other mixed cities. So this was the, the surprise within an anticipated uh, clash, as I said. And then I'm, I was asking the question if we have the birth of a new arena, if a new battlefield was, was born here, because we see all the, the mixed cities um, in, in a turmoil and in a civil violence, uh, very bad situation. Yeah, so this is a surprise. As I said, we, we've seen six days of civil riots, mob killings in the street. Uh, three residents, Israeli residents, were killed by other residents. This is very um, unique and extreme. Uh, fire and clashes in the street. Uh, curfew was for the first time imposed on Israeli city. It was never, historically, it was never like that. I talked specifically to uh, police officers and Israeli border police that were shocked by this event. Roads um, were closed nationwide, no early warning. And as I said, mixed cities were never defined as an arena or a battlefield. And this was the first time that um, this thing erupted and was, was perceived as a surprise. So the root cause anal analysis, I'm not gonna dive into it. I'll just say that it, I, I took this kind of um, pyramid um, shape um, to divide the causes to deep-seated causes, immediate causes, and a spark, a trigger. This um, um, this causal model was taken also from the OR Commission um, report of October 2000. It's a qualitative methodology. Yeah, and main findings, uh, as I said, were divided to all these three layers, but also in the national level, local level, and community level. Uh, so what we see is local housing crisis um, that echoed similar case. So um, the eviction order and the problems in Sheikh Jarrah actually echoed similar cases of housing crisis within the city of Lod. So people over there, while, while they went to protest during uh, May 10th night, they felt and they knew that something that what's going on in Sheikh Jarrah is actually echoing something that they are suffering from. Um, horizontal inequalities, all participants, Jews, Arabs, um, NGOs, security experts, everyone pinpointed the fact that social inequalities are a main issue in large and mixed cities. Um, and this was, as I said, expressed uh, and explained by everyone. In terms of um, socioeconomic and gentrification components, so kind of like in research, um, the ideological gentrification that we see in mixed cities was a big part of the tension that they suffer from. So they played a central role 
on in the event. And all of us, I mean, and participants and also the, the literature show that um, triggers or sparks are random and inevitable. We can't really control them. So therefore we have to look at these kind of causes, the immediate causes and the repeated causes in order to try and pinpoint the reasons, the factors, um, and, and, and afterwards ways to prevent or mitigate such violence. So after everything, I put everything in this causal model, but I'm not gonna walk through it. Um, the main theories um, that I use are two. The, the only one that I'm gonna explain here is Ted Gurd theory, the relative deprivation one over here. And I wanna read this. So Gurd was um, researching uh, civil wars and was trying, and his book is Why Men Rebel. He was trying to explain how people go to the street and why, because you have poverty and problems all over the world, but not in every country you'll find a civil war. So what are the reasons that make people erupt and go to the street? Um, what he says is that the potential for collective violence varies strongly with the intensity and scope of relative deprivation among members of a collectivity. Means relative deprivation, if you think of, of mixed cities, when you see each other, you see different neighbors, neighborhoods, you see different socioeconomic levels. And um, of course, every community has its own um, crime rates, its own um, um, resources. Um, this relative deprivation is a main factor of any civil violence and civil unrest. So what you've seen before in the um, in the pyramid, I just put it like that. So we have the spark here, we had spark in Jerusalem, we had the national level immediate causes in the housing solidarity in Shah Jahan. We have religious holidays, as we said, Jerusalem Day and Ramadan. And we have local factors and in mixed cities and mainly in Lod where everything started and was the most severe. We had local polarization between communities. We had inflaming rhetoric of leaders, of the mayor, of local leaders over there. And we had religious intolerance between the different communities. Everyone um, said that. And then in repeated causes, we have things that I guess most of us are familiar with. Um, crime crisis, social inequality, um, and relative deprivation, uh, also part of the local gentrification in this city. And this is what I was pinpointing to, kind of like a blind spot that security and intelligence communities um, didn't see, didn't predict, and um, actually just only afterwards in a two years perspective, also security experts and people from the security forces said that this part, they were never looking into it. And this was a big part of the eruption that they, that they couldn't see. So this is the outcomes. We had many. I think that one of the most important and surprising things is that after um, the clashes, what we've seen is the voting extremism, um, specifically in mixed cities. So both communities, voting to more extreme parties, which was part of the out outcome of this uh, election. In terms of um, conclusions, so I think that one of the most important things is how to look at um, uh, maybe a wider attack or, or security threat and to try and analyze specific components in it that might surprise us. And here it was, as I said, an anticipated clash that within it, we saw an experience of surprise that we couldn't um, predict. Um, I think that um, this case is also the intersection of security and national security, but also socioeconomic um, grievances and um, social inequalities. And this is very important to, to try and expand our land. Um, another thing is the security and intelligence community's blind spots, how to try and recognize it and how to try and, and as I said, expand our lens in order to recognize it. Um, and eventually, municipal actors that didn't know or didn't, they were not aware of the fact that their act within uh, a Lod mosque, a very small one, can really affect a whole country and the, the israeli Palestinian conflict. Uh, this is it. Thank you. Uh, just the mic, the mic, please, okay, yeah, and yeah. microphone. Yeah. Oh, um. Go for the. 
Okay, thank you for having me here. And um, it's a work on progress. And it's about um concept of pluralism, Israel and other uh, intelligent community. But the most surprising thing I found is that it's very much endemic to Israel. No one else used this term. And there are quite uh, other communities, quite um, against this uh, this term. So uh, this is mainly a conceptual problem. So it's where well, it starts, in, uh, as uh, most of you know, in Agrenat, that uh, thought of the pluralism as a concept, as a, um, uh, conceptual terms that will organize the intelligent community uh, and some kind of uh, uh, magic solution for all the trouble of, uh, of not knowing things. What they thought that you can see here that if you will organize, if, that if you organize the intelligent community by um, divided dividing the uh, community to the parts and let each one of them to search, to search alone. Uh, eventually, somehow it will come to a competition and uh, the answer will be uh, presented to the, uh, to the decision makers and he will choose the best uh, theory uh, that that you that you have, and uh, of course it's not it's not just the agronaut. The agronaut was uh, a little bit uh, earlier with the Yadin Sharp uh, committee uh, that um, said quite the same. As you can see ar along the, the years, that there were other committees uh, that uh, suggested quite the same idea. As you can see, there are differences, but the main idea is that uh, each organization and each level should uh, investigate in itself uh, the materials and to present by itself to uh, the decision makers. And somehow there will be a competition of ideas uh, on the table of the decision makers and the decision makers will be able to choose. Uh, I don't, no one asked how he can choose the right one, but this is how it goes. You uh, will choose the, uh, the thing. So there was some um, a discourse about these things between uh, uh, Uri Bar Yosef, Professor Bar Yosef, that suggested a uh, long time ago and uh, not suggested it lately, that will um, form another uh, level of national uh, intelligence in the uh, near the government, uh, but again, it's not. Instead, it's not something that organizes the community, but alongside the other uh, organizations. On the other hand, uh, there is um, um, Dr. Meir Finkel that suggested that uh, the um, the pluralism is working well. And he saw in, in his article that uh, although there are some uh, surprises uh, around the, the road, there are also classes of thought and everything work quite well. And he suggested that the, uh, that the things that didn't work, it's because um, it was not the main issue or the main uh, subject of research of the uh, intelligent community, it was a side one. So it's okay to fall in that in that arena, in that uh, subject. But here comes the, the October 7th, 
and uh, you could, no one can uh, argue that the Palestinian issue is main, it's in the heart of uh, the intelligence, uh, the Israeli intelligence com community, and no one can argue that this is the most pluralistic <laughs> uh, arena in the uh, intelligence community, both in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, organizations and in the levels of research. So you, uh, it's a problem. <laughs> Now, when we go to um, to search, there is a um, discomfort of this idea along the road. Some of us, uh, some of them here, but uh, um, mainly the main issue is that the um, is the the things that need to be discussed. Um, organization needs to be discussed their idea in order to to go to the decision maker with a unified idea or a um, unified know-how about the differences. This is the, the, the mainly the, the subject. Um, and now when, when you are going to the other communities, there is no pluralism uh, in there. Uh, after the 9-11 in, in, uh, in the US uh, uh, intelligence, they, form the DNI, and as you can see, they are against pluralism. They want integrated community, and not just uh, that the data will flow, but it, the, the idea is that there is someone to manage the community, to manage the, uh, the flow of intelligence and the uh, main, main things they have to do. Uh, and also they... Um, uh, they form the um, the um, how you say that um, the integrated uh, uh, the integrated mechanism of uh, things inside. Also in the United Kingdom, which long time ago uh, they have the J the JEC, uh, and again as you can see, they are managing the uh, intelligent community and. Uh, it's not that uh, the MI5 and the MI6 and other uh, part of the community in the, the United States are not um, independent. They are independent, but there is a level of um, organizing and in this, from above. So it, uh, we need to go to the term, term itself. So, what Israel, of course, go to the, the, the first part of the multi, uh, uh, multiplicity of the idea that there is a coexistence, there, would, there should be a coexistence of ideas uh, and organization. But Israel forgot the second part that is more friction. You need to do criticism, to, to engage one with another in order to um, do it right. You can also you can see that in, de in democracy when um, when you have um, other mechanisms. So you, we know that in, the, in democracy we want uh, um, each one to uh, each, each one have a, one vote. But again, there is uh, an election that majority is in the end cho chosen. So, what is the mechanism in Israel? There is no mechanism, such a, me a mechanism. Uh, so what? Uh, it's something we need to form. One other subject we need to, to discuss is that maybe there is no actual pluralism, even in the in the soft side of the of, of it, uh, because there is no um, difference between. between each organization, they are all uh, composed with the same personnel. They are all composed uh, or over uh, going over through, through the same um, uh, training, and so there are no such difference between the organizations. 
uh, not personnel, not methods, and not training. So what I, I I'm trying to use to use um, uh, Lawrence Lessig theory about uh, code, about regulation of of the code, um, and what you, if we we suggest four issues that have to regulate. Uh, the first two we know Israel has, uh, has them, but we don't have this, the uh, lower uh, the lower terms of norms. We have no norms of uh, clashing or, or uh, uh, discussion between organization. We have no no something we we need to develop, and we don't have a market of idea that uh, uh, combine the ideas together. Another way to think about that is it's the, uh, an organized concept. And uh, if I would suggest that the Israel now is more in the uh, place of conservative uh, um, organizations or maybe evolutionary, but we need to move to the other side, which we should, the, the, the intelligent community shouldn't be revolutionary, altogether revolutionary because we need uh, some conservatism, but maybe Kaizen is the right place to uh, to go to because it's a place that encourages the, uh, the change. It's looking for change, but with organizing uh, a procedure. So that's it for now. Thank you. Yeah. אוקיי. <laughs> 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 לא, נראה לי שהוא לקח את זה. נועם, לקחת את הקליק? לא, הנה הוא עלה. Okay. Now, I, I didn't know I was going to have to talk in English, but I, <laughs> I think I, 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 I will try my best. <laughs> uh, so my name is Yako from the Technion, and I want to talk about the dilemmas of robustness, opportunists, and informativeness in, and implications for intelligence analysis. And I'm going to do it standing on one foot. Um, so my talk is, the emphasis is methodological. Uh, the first point is that um, intelligence analysts use evidence to um, formulate assertions that are informative and reliable. They also need to be relevant, but I'm gonna ignore the relevance problem. Um, and by reliability, what I mean is that only large changes in the evidence would uh, significantly alter the informativeness. It's reliable if only large changes in the evidence would cause the informativeness of the assertion that I'm gonna pass on to my boss and to fall below a required level. And I'm gonna be talking in the context of InfoGap theory, um, which is my baby, as you will find out. And in InfoGap theory, reliability is expressed by robustness. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. And my first claim is that the informativeness of an assertion trades off against its reliability. The more informative the insertion, the less reliable it is. And the more reliable it is, the less informative it is. And I will try and make that a little bit plausible. In my paper, it's stated as a formal proof with you know, the usual fine print of proofs. Um, so I, I, my claim is that it's uh, quite generic. And this creates a dilemma for the analyst because he wants to be both informative 
and reliable. And my first claim is that you can't have it all. The more informative, the less reliable. That is my first claim. Um, the, the second claim starts, deals with um, the other side of the information coin. And that is that intelligence analysts formulate assertions to pass on to their boss that are informative and opportune to new evidence. Now, what does that mean? Opportuneness of an assertion is the property that small changes in evidence cause the informativeness become wonderfully greater. An assertion is very opportune to uncertainty in the evidence. If small additions to the evidence, evidence we didn't know about yesterday, if small additions to the evidence cause the informativeness to improve wonderfully, this is very different from robustness. And um, it, this will be dealt with with the concept of opportunity in info gap theory. And my second claim is that oppor, oppor, that informativeness trades off against opportunity. That is, the more informative the, the assertion is, the less it is able to benefit wonderfully from small increments of uh, evidence. And this creates another dilemma for the uh, intelligence analyst, because the analyst wants to formulate assertions. The assertion that I'll look at shortly is China will invade Taiwan in six months. The um, analyst wants to formulate assertions that are informative, but that are also opportune to things that we do not yet know. We want to formulate assertions that will become much more informative as the next little bit of information trickles in. That's different from robustness. The call and, and an assertion is robust if its informativeness is not degraded uh, over a wide range of unknown or new evidence. Informativeness and opportunity is a different dilemma confronting the intelligence analyst. So the analyst faces um, two dilemmas informativeness versus reliability against unknown future evidence and informativeness versus opportuneness from unknown future evidence. I think my next slide, yeah. So that my focus is really on uncertainty. Um, in parentheses, I will say I'm not an intelligence person. I was a Kaban Nunket. In, in the, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm not an intelligence person, I'm an uncertainty guy. And the core of what I'm saying here is that uncertainty has profound impact on assertions that intelligence analysts formulate. And it's there are two types of, un, of, un, of impact. One is the degradation of informativeness due to new evidence that I didn't know about yesterday. And the other is the improvement of informativeness of an assertion due to evidence that I didn't know yesterday. And maybe in a somewhat more abstract level, uncertainty is the core here. And my focus is how to model and manage what I do not know. Now that sounds pretty presumptuous, but I'm I'm an Israeli. We're we're Hutzpanik, okay? As um <clears throat> despite the act. Okay. Um so modeling and managing uncertainty and its impact on assertions that the intelligent analyst will pass on to his boss and the two different aspects of those uncertainty. The detrimental, that is uncertain evidence can degrade the informativeness of an assertion and a certain evidence can improve the informant. And of course, <clears throat> as I said at the start, my emphasis is methodological. We need a methodology for evaluating the reliability of an assertion, reliability vis-a-vis -vis things I do not know. And we need a methodology for evaluating, someone put this stick here, um, 
we need a methodology for evaluating the opportuneness from things we do not know. And um, I'm going to describe that methodology in the next six minutes. I've written six books and 120 articles, but six minutes will be enough. Um, and it's based on interval gap theory. And if you're um, interested, there's a website with lots and lots of sources in many different di disciplines. Info gap is applied in medicine and economics and engineering, of course, and many other. Okay, so I, I'm going to present a really simple example. Here's the assertion. And let me stress, I, I don't know anything about China. I was in Singapore once. Um, but um, um, so this is a hypothetical example. I, I, I'm not in any way claiming that, that the, there's anything authentic or realistic about my analysis, but it, it illustrates what one who knows what they're talking about might conceivably do. So here's the assertion, China will invade Taiwan in the next six months. <laughs> And the assertion is reliable, it's robust, if it's strong in the following six attributes that I will describe. What I'm doing here is presenting a methodology by which the analyst can assess robustness to uncertainty, reliability of an assertion. And that's for reliability against what he does not yet know, reliability against unknown uh, evidence. And that's very important because the analyst has to assess the trade-off between the reliability of the assertion and its informativeness. Now, informativeness, I can assess just semantically from the assertion. In the next six months or in the next six hours, one is more informative than the other. But I need a tool for assessing the robustness, the reliability of the assertion. And that's what I'm going to illustrate here in this schematic example. There are six attributes proxy. I don't know. The first is resilience. How resilient is, the, I, I'm focusing here on uh, Chinese military capability. There could be other aspects. China has a large, diverse military, but it has little combat experience. And so its resilience against uh, surprising disruptions of its plans might be considered to be moderate. I will evaluate each of these six attributes on a scale of um, low, moderate, or high. So the first attribute of the reliability of my assertion that China will invade in six months is that its resilience against disruption is at best moderate. The second attribute by which I assess the reliability of the assertion is the redundancy of China's military capability. China's military is much larger than any other military in the world. Depends how you count, but that's generally I think a true statement, the redundancy of Chinese military capability is high, which um, of course is related uh, to supporting the assertion. Two minutes, okay, yeah, yeah. but I have the clicker, but okay. Um, flexibility, tactical flexibility. Chinese society is hierarchical, authoritarian, the tactical flexibility in my hypothetical analysis of military, Chinese military is low, Adaptiveness, strategic adaptiveness uh, of the Chinese military is based on uh, high officers that are well-trained and highly professional. Their adaptiveness is high. Margin of safety um, <clears throat> how, um, for Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Chinese military and population is greater than that of Taiwan. One could say much greater. Um, <clears throat> so the margin of safety for an invasion is high comprehensiveness. This is um, everything that's left over, the multidimensional uh, assessment of the situation. Um, there are many military challenges of an invasion. Taiwan is uh, not a little puppy. Uh, there are potential domestic uh, resistance and certainly international challenges. The comprehensiveness of Chinese invasion of Taiwan would be low. So if we sort of uh, semantically average these, I guess, um, it's almost six. Um, if we more or less average them, uh, we would say that the overall assessment of the reliability of this assertion is um, moderate to high. Okay, so um, this is important for the analyst because he has to assess um, the trade-off between the reliability and uh, the informative. 
So I'm um, wrapping up. I, I have um, identified uh, two dilemmas facing um, analysts. One is an irrevocable trade-off between the informativeness of the assertion and its reliability vis-a-vis -vis what I do not yet know. And the second is the uh, trade-off between informativeness and the opportuneness, the beneficial information enhancing uh, quality of what I do not yet know. And I have presented a methodology uh, for evaluating the robustness. If um, this gentleman here would go out for maybe five minutes, I could also talk how to yeah. do the opportunist, but I don't think he's going to do that, so I won't. Um, <clears throat> so um, with that, I will close. You can ask questions. Okay. Tov. אז אנחנו עוברים כעת אה, לחלק, ה... לחלק האומנותי, נגיד. אה, כן, הפרסים של הפורום ללימודי מודיעין, אה, היינו אמורי, עשינו תהליך רציני של, אה, של קולות קוראים והגשות וועדות ששפטו, והטקס המרגש היה אמור לקרות במליאה של הכנס השנתי ש... ב-11 באוקטובר. הפורום לא הצליח. כן. אז כן, אז דחינו אותו להזדמנות החגיגית הזו, ובכל זאת היה לנו חשוב לכבד את הזוכים וגם את השופטים שקראו את החומרים. אז, אז, אנחנו, אז אנחנו נתחיל, רק לפני שנתחיל עם הפרסים עצמם, יש תעודה שאנחנו רוצים להעניק לאור פיאלקוב שנמצא איתנו כאן, בהערכה רבה לתרומתו, אתה יכול לבוא, כן, בהערכה רבה לתרומתו להקמת האתר של הפורום, הרבה שעות של הדרכה וסיוע, בעיקר העיצוב הוא שלו, של... מי עובד איתך? ועכשיו נעבור לפרס הראשון שהוא לעבודה מחקרית מצטיינת, אודי בבקשה. ערב טוב, שמי אודי רן, אוניברסיטת חיפה. את הפרס לעבודת המחקר המצטיין של תלמידי מחקר בחרנו לקרוא על שם תת-אלוף עמוס גלעד, זכרונו לברכות. עמוס גיפו עשרה. יום ארוך, מצטיין. זה גם לא היה מוקלט, אז תעשה שוב. חשבתי על זה בדרך שזה... יש פה טעות. סייאל, כן, אבל... כמובן לא חשבתי. כן, בדיוק. טוב, ערב טוב, שמי אודי ערן, מאוניברסיטת חיפה, את הפרס לעבודת המחקר המצטיינת של תלמידי מחקר, בחרנו לקרוא על שם תת-אלוף עמוס גלבוע, זיכרונו לברכה, עמוס נולד בקריית חיים, שירת כלוחם וכקצין בגולני, למד אחר כך באוניברסיטה העברית ומשם חזר למודיעין, הפך למומחה מוביל, כפי שרבים פה יודעים, לזירה הצפונית, הזירה המזרחית, ושירת כראש חטיבת המחקר בין השנים 1982-1984. בשני עשורים שלאחר מכן הוא נשאר מאוד מעורב בחטיבת המחקר והפך לדמות מובילה בעיצוב המתודולוגיה שלה, כולל כתיבת הספר הירוק, מה שנקרא, של מחקר מודיעיני שיצא נדמה לי כבר בהוצאה שנייה, ובתחילת שנות האלפיים הוא התחיל לכתוב סדרה של, קרא לזה עיונים מתודולוגיים, אבל בעצם נרטיבים היסטוריים של צמתים חשובות בהיסטוריה של, בהתחלה של המודיעין ובהמשך בעצם של ישראל, כולל הנסיגה מלבנון, ולבסוף הוא כתב ספר גדול בהוצאת ידיעות אחרונות עם המרכז, את הביוגרפיה של אהרון יריב מראשי המיתולוגים. עמוס מאוד התעניין בפיתוח העניין המיתולוגי ומאוד עודד את המרכז למורשת המודיעין ללכת לכיוון הזה, במידה מסוימת הוא אבי המאמצים שעכשיו הגיעו לבשלות. אז אין ראוי ממנו שהפרס יקרא על שמו. הזוכה בפרס השנה לעבודה המחקרית היא הגברת שיר שחם, עבודה שהיא כתבה באוניברסיטת ברקלי שם העבודה היא Prevention and Mitigation of Civil Violence and Multifaceted Approach, קיבלנו פה uh, תיאור של העבודה, uh, יחד עם חברי דוקטור עופר גוטרמן הייתי בוועדת הפרס, uh, נימוקי, נימוקינו הם uh, עבודתה של שירה מנתחת את אירועי, טוב קיבלנו הצגה של זה אבל <laughs> כתבנו את זה כבר אז, uh, 
מנתחת את אירועי מאי 2021 כהפתעה אסטרטגית, העבודה תורמת לפיתוח מושג ההפתעה האסטרטגית בהקשרי ביטחון פנים, ומציעה מודל רב שכבתי הכולל אינדיקטורים יישומיים לבחינה ולמעקב. בנוסף, היא מצביעה על הצורך של ארגוני הביטחון והמודיעין לבנות תפיסות עדכניות והוליסטיות יותר להתמודדות עם אתגר זה, תוך יישום מרכיבי שילוביות בין ארגונית ושותפויות עם גורמים אזרחיים, ותוך פיתוח יכולות מחקר רב תחומיות. עבודה בנויה לתלפיות, כתובה היטב ומציפה תחום שחשיבותו עולה בארץ ובעולם, בין היתר על רקע האתגרים הפנימיים גוברים בפניהם ניצבות דמוקרטיות ברחבי העולם. בנוסף ראוי מבחינה מתודולוגית לציון היישום המוצלח של מתודולוגיית המחקר הנטוע בשדה, שבא לי לידי ביטוי בשילוב בין סקירת ספרות לבין ביצוע רעיונות, באופן שמוביל מוביל למסקנות מעמיקות ולהמלצות מקיפות. שירה, ברכות. אני אגיד רק מילה אחת שראיתי פה על הכוס שזה יפה אבל אני מאוד חושבת שאני ככה יצאתי מהשירות, ממש יצאתי מהשירות ב-22 אחרי, והייתי נרעשת משומר חומות והרגשתי שיש שם משהו באמת החתיכה החסרה הזאת והרגשתי שאני צריכה לנסוע עד הפסיפי כדי לראות מה קורה בלוד רמלה ובישראלי, בקונפליקט הישראלי פלסטיני אז לפעמים להרחיק זה טוב ותודה רבה על ההכרה יש לך כוח לחזור להנהלה אוקיי, פרס הבא, קופר, זה שלך, אני צריך את האודי, את הניילונית בבקשה, ברשותך, קופר בינתיים אתה תסדר לעצמך את ה... אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקיי.אוקי
אגב, מאפיינת את קובי לא רק במאמר הזה, אלא בכל מאמר בחרה הוועדה להעניק את פרס המאמר המסתיים בתחום לימודי המודיעין בשנת תשפ"ג, דוקטור יעקב פלקו. חברי הוועדה היו אופק, יתר מתניה ואחר. אני רוצה לשאול שאלה אחת ‫לא, לא, בגלל האותיות. ‫-אה, כן. 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 אז קודם כל המון תודה, זה באמת מרגש, זה כבוד גדול. זה הפרס הראשון שלי פה בפורום המזרח הזה, זה מתכנן כאן. וזה מאוד רלוונטי, המאמר הזה, אני חושב, קודם כל היום לגבי מה שקורה בנושא, וגם במקומות נוספים מהסוג הזה, אני חושב שזה מאיראן, אני חושב שזה מאיראן, אנחנו יכולים גם אולי... כן, אני רואה שם בסוף בסיכום שזה כנראה תקף לעוד כל מיני חברות וזהו, ואפרופו מזכירות ככה, אז יש עוד אחד לדבר על זה, אני כולי תקווה שזה נשאר, ונשמח להציג את הפרס. יש גם את מה שאתם כתבתם. אז אתה מוזמן ל... טוב, הקריטריונים שעמדו בפני ועדת הפרס, לא רק מצוינות היסטורית וכתיבה מעניינת, אלא ספרים שיש להם תרומה מהותית לעולם המודיעין. בעיקר לדור הצעיר אנשי וקציני המודיעין וחייליו. הספר שזכה זה חקה, יצחק חופי מהפלמ"ח לראשות המוסד, כתב אותו אבנר שור ואבירם הלוי. אני הכרתי את אבירם, מכיר אותו הרבה שנים ולא הערכתי את כושר הכתיבה שלו כפי ש... הוא כותב, אה אתה מספר, והוא כותב, אוקיי. אז הספר של שור והלוי בוחן אדם שהשפעתו הצבאית והמודיעינית על מדינת ישראל לא נבחנה פה, זה ספר חדשני פורץ דרך. פאקה באמת איש צנוע, הלוואי וקציני מודיעין כאלה יהיו לנו דוגמה ומופת, זה לא כתוב פה, זה אני אומר, הוא לא כתב אוטוביוגרפיה ולעיתים היה ביקורתי כלפי אנשי מודיעין שלקו בחטא הכתיבה חקה הביע את חותמו גם כצרכן מודיעין ובמיוחד בתפקיד תלוף פיקוד צפון לפני ובמהלך מלחמת יום הכיפורים כיצרן מודיעין וכאופרטור. בעיקר הוא הביא את זה לידי ביטוי בתפקיד שלו כראש המוסד. אין ספק שטראומת המלחמה השפיעה על הראייה המודיעינית שלו, על העשייה ועל ההתרעה המוקדמת. בטיפול בנושא האיום הבלתי קונבנציונלי של מדינת ישראל כשהוא נתן דגש מאוד מרכזי לתוכנית הגרעין העיראקי או האיראני. ספרם, אבל זה, זה יצר דפוסי פעולה מבצעיים ומודיעיניים ואיסופיים במעגל שני ויש איזו משמעות אדירה באשר ליכולות שלנו אחר כך לפעול גם במה, במעגל השלישי Uh, הטיפול בנושא האיום הבלתי קונבנציונלי על מדינת ישראל בדגש על uh, תוכנית הגרעין העיראקית הוא זה שהביא אותנו לאחר מכן לשלבים מבצעיים מאוד משמעותיים. הספר של שור והלוי הוא לא רק סיפורו של אדם מיוחד, מצבי, איש מודיעין, אלא מביא לנו לקחים ותובנות על עיקרי העשייה המודיעינית ברמה הלאומית, הטלת ספק, שאלות נכונות אמון ביכולות ועוד יותר מזה באנשים, לקיחת סיכונים ופתיחות 
כלפי דעות אחרות. ספר זה ראוי שיקרא על ידי קציני וקצינות המודיעין הצעירים כחלק מההכשרה שלהם. הספר הזוכה בציון לשבח. תן רגע, תן להם את הפרס. כן, ניתן את הפרס. אוקיי. ואבנר ו... בירן, בבקשה. אני עושה את המחקר והוא כותב, זאת אומרת זה מאוד מאוד דיכוטומי וקל להבנה וקל למימוש, אז למרות שאני לא באמת איש מודיעין. אתה עושה, כן, אני יודע. אתה אמור, אתה אמור, כן. שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,שניה,
תודה רבה. אז מאוד מרגש להיות פה וצריך את המיקרופון, בדרך כלל מאוד רועש. אז זה מאוד מרגש להיות פה, זה באמת המס הראשון שאני מקבל מהעבודה המאוד מכובדת הזאת. אני הייתי רוצה באמת לומר מילה או שתיים על הרלוונטיות של המחקר הזה לדעתי היום. דבר ראשון הוא עוסק בהסכירי חרב. אנשים שהם גורמי אלימות פרטיים, הרפתקנים, ועם החשיבות של וגנר וכוחות חצי ממשלתיים, לא ממשלתיים דומים, ולהבדיל גם החשיבות של אנשי עסקים פרטיים כמו אילון מאסק במלחמות ומערכות היום הנושא הזה של הרפתקנות צבאית ומודיעינית ואלימות פרטית הוא נושא מאוד חשוב שצריך ללמוד אותו. הדבר השני זה הנאצים שפרקש הזכיר. אחד מהדברים העיקריים שאני טוען בספר הזה שהניאו נאצים או הנאצים הוותיקים אחרי 45 אפילו אלה שהגדירו את עצמם כנאצים שזה לא היה רוב הדברים ברובם היו יצורים מאוד שונים מהנאצים של תקופת המלחמה. רובם הודו שהיטלר נכשל, שהנאציזם צריך מאוד להשתנות, שדברים לא יכולים להמשיך כמו שהם היו, והם או שהם ויתרו על אנטי קומוניזם, או שהם ויתרו על אנטי דמוקרטיות, או שהם ויתרו על אנטישמיות, היה ברור לכולם שאי אפשר לשמור את כל החבילה. ובהקשר שלנו של הדיונים על עזה וחמאס ודה-רדיקליזציה, זה מבהיר את החשיבות העליונה של תפוסה מוחלטת. ושינוי גם אצל הגורמים האידיאולוגיים והפנאטיים ביותר ולבסוף בספר הזה אני טוען שאותם הנאצים לשעבר לא היו חשובים בפני עצמם הם היו קבוצה של לוזרים, הרפתקנים די עלובים אבל הפחד מהם, הרגשות שהם עוררו הוביל לתגובת יתר אצל שירותי מודיעין ותגובת היתר הזאת הייתה חשובה אני חושב שמה שאנחנו ראינו בשביעי באוקטובר במידה רבה זה תגובת חסר זה בדיוק הדבר ההפוך. זה ההנחה של איך שהעיתונאי גדעון לוי פעם קרא לכמה צבא יחפני מאז. הם לא רציניים, מה אתם מתעללים בהם? זה מין קבוצה של לא יוצלחים, ש... ואנחנו ראינו מה קרה. אז הערכת יתר והערכת חסר יותר מדי פחד, אבל גם פחות מדי פחד, יכול להוביל לאסונות מודיעיניים. זה שלושה מהמסרים שאולי הספר הזה יכול להעביר. עכשיו אני כותב אחרי דבר אקטואלי בשביל התרגום היפני וגם בשביל הפייפר גריפה האנגלי אז אני אנסה להדגיש את כל הדברים. תודה. ועם זה אנחנו מסיימים את האירוע. אם נהנתם, ספרו לחבריכם וגם תענו על הסקר הזה. אני אודה לכם מאוד, זה חשוב. אופס. במייל ואפשר לסרוק את ה...